This gentleman played not only on one, but two lines that had to name the fearsome foursome. He was a great defensive tackle back in the 60s with the Lions and Rams, Roger Brown. How are you doing today, Roger? Hey, I'm doing great, guy, and uh, I appreciate talking with you guys that you are not eating turkey or anything like that, so there you go. <laughs> well, we're, we're, I've got everything at my restaurant. I sell it all, believe me. <laughs> What's your favorite food? My food is uh, to eat at Roger Brown's Restaurant and Sports Bar in Portsmouth, Virginia. And we have shrimp and grits. That's awesome. So who does the cooking, you or you have cooks for that? I do a lot of it, but then again, they keep me out of the kitchen. <laughs> but you do manage quality control by sampling it, I will assume. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, the main thing is my key is not to eat the food, but to sell it. Okay. And that's why I'm down to 240, 14 pounds. Wow. That's a little lower than your playing weight. Yeah, a little bit. But you know what? I wish to God I was playing today so I could make way in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. they had weigh in for you when you weighed uh, 300 oh, man. pounds you know back when I played every Thursday we had to weigh in and with the Rams it was $10 a pound with the Lions it was $10 a pound and I look at today what Nadamak and Sue gets fine holy moly but then again I never got Ninety million dollars a year. I was paid eight thousand a year. Uh, you know, they. I paid them to come and draft me. Are you kidding? I would have paid them to play in that in the NFL. Oh. Okay. When you went to Maryland State College, how did it, a guy from Nyack, New York, end up in Maryland? Well, the the funny thing, I got uh, a letter from Duke University. Can you imagine that? And we had a health teacher at Nyack High School in Nyack, New York. And he said, Roger, they don't know who you are <laughs> because there's a mistake here. So that didn't work. And then when they drafted me and the coaches – Earl Banks, and they all came up to Nyack and watched me play. And I said, I'm with you. Let's go. Let's do it. How, how did Ben Schwartzwalder at Syracuse or Rip Engel at Penn State not recruit you then? Well, you've got to remember, this is going back to early days. I mean... When you look at the NFL, you look at all the colleges, you look at the PAC, the Big Ten, you look at all of them, and there was a lot of them that had a lot of black players, and black players weren't really recruited back then. Uh, you know, it, it, it was one of those things that we were far and in between, and I just didn't get the nod, but I remember I had a chance at Syracuse because we had a uh, a coach, and that was named Joseph Grzybowski, who went to Syracuse. And when they looked at my transcript, they said, whoa, you need to get up a few notches before we'll get you. So if you go to a uh, a junior college or a lesser college and obtain a B or a plus average, we'll transfer you. Well, I did that, but when I went to Maryland State, I fell in love with it, and I stayed down there. Okay. And when you went there, you, you went there hoping to be a fullback, right? I went down there, one of the fastest 300-pounders in the world. <laughs> I could run over God at the time, believe me. <laughs> and 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 then I was a fullback, and we had a game, I think it was against Morgan State, and one of our tackles got injured, and they said, Rog, we need you to fill in, and I never got out of there. You, you did too good a job. 
I did too good a job, and they kept me as an offensive lineman and a defensive lineman. So that was my life. I could imagine you at Syracuse, a brown backfield with you and Jim Brown. That would have been devastating. Well, he he, I think I think he left about the year I started. So that would have been awesome. But then again, I would have uh, I would have been in in competition with uh, what's the guy's name. Ernie Davis? Ernie Davis, yeah. That would have been a a heck of a backfield. Hey, I got to tell you, you know, when I weighed 300 pounds, I could run a 10 flat 100. So I was awesome. I could have been, uh, I could have been a hell of a back. Yeah. Now, was that uphill or downhill? That was both. Mostly (laughs) downhill, though. (laughs) When you played in the Chicago All-Star game, was Otto Graham your coach? When I what? Otto Graham was the coach, yeah. Yeah. That was that was a that was a great thrill to play in that game. I heard he was a difficult guy to play for though. Well, Otto was okay. I mean, it, it, we had a lot of coaches and a lot of assistants. And just the idea of playing with all the pack and the top college players from all the big schools, and I, from tiny Maryland State, had a chance to play with them. My goal was to be the starting lineman, and I made it. And uh, to this day, that was the biggest thrill I had. Now, if I'm correct about this uh the new york titans also drafted you the new york titans back then drafted me as well as the saskatchewan rough riders and i gotta tell you this the rough riders offered me more as a signing bonus than the lions gave me my whole contract i signed for eight thousand dollars a year they were going to give me $8,000 signing bonus. Can you imagine that? And and you passed it up? I passed it up because I figured if I didn't make it in the NFL, I'd go up to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, but you got to look at Night Train Lane came the year I came. And uh, they had Alex Karras and uh, Bill Glass, Darius McCord, Joe Schmidt, and then they got all the other guys were like rookies. We were all rookies there together. I know Gail Coddale and I were together at the college all-star game. And uh, it, was, it was quite a thrill, but I was bound and determined to be a starting defensive lineman. What was the first training camp like for you with the Lions? The training camp was was unique and different, you know, but I didn't pay it much attention because I had a job to do, and, and I went out to make it. I went out to just get going. But i got to tell you the funny story in the world. I don't know if you ever remember the movie Paper Lion with George Plimpton. Sure. And all those little kids around training camp up in Cranbrook, they stole my helmet. <laughs> you got that? And, and I'm down here in Virginia, and do you know these guys who are adults now bought that helmet to me a year ago? And they said, hey, you know, it was just a thrill to take it. It was just laying there in the training camp. It was on the floor in the gym, and we took it. And that was the, that was the kids that George, George Plimpton threw the ball to, and he practiced with them. And they saw a chance to take the helmet, and they did. And they returned it, and I still got it, my original helmet. It's absolutely incredible. I think the statute of limitations run so they can't get prosecuted anymore for that. I would never <laughs> prosecute them in the world. I gave them all a free meal. Are you kidding? <laughs> I 
I remember uh, talking about George Plimpton with some of the Lions players. They said it was crazy when he was there. Was that was the biggest fun I ever had in a training camp. It was when George Plimpton was there. I mean, we just had a ball, and he was fun to have in camp. Uh, but we 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 had fun, kind of hit him hit him a little extra hard every once in a while. But it was a great time. Everybody knows George Plimpton from the book, but also he was part of the uh, assassination of John F- or Bobby Kennedy and Rosie Greer, who was a member of the Fearsome Foursome, was the one who wrestled the gun away. I remember talking to Rosie about that. Sure, sure. You know, Ro is uh, a great friend. And, you know, the sad part is that when I left the Lions Fearsome Foursome, and went out with the L.A. Rams. Rosie never played again because he tore his Achilles tendon. And Deacon Jones, Lamar Lundy, and Marilyn Olson were the fearsome foursome. And the sad part is that all those guys today have passed away. Yeah. And I look at with the Lions, Alex Karras, Darius McCord, and Sam Williams with the original Fearsome Foursome have passed away. So I'm the last one that's a well and still vertical. (laughs) That's the best way to be. Well, you know what? You got to keep going. Definitely. So did did you get extra satisfaction out of sacking? George Plimpton? No, not really, because he was so much fun. But you know what we wanted to do was just to let George, since we knew he was going to write a book, but we wanted to let him know what it was really like to get hit. And they they elected me to hit him. <laughs> so... So I remember I gave him a pretty good shot, but I kind of held up a little bit. But uh, I think he still have a, a sore spot after I hit him. But uh, that 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 he was a great guy. He was, he was a lot of fun. Who was the leader of the Lions defense? Was it Joe Schmidt as the middle linebacker? Not really. Um, I think back then Joe was a great guy. Uh, Alex was fun. Um, but we all were leaders in our own right. And we kept after each other and Joe was there and, uh, uh, but, but, you know, we had, we, we had a job to do and we all talk with each other. And back then we would sit in our own little area on the, on the bench. I mean, today, I don't know how many teams, but your defensive line or an area one, then you have your backs, and then you have your offense. And we did all of that, and we sat together to talk about what was going on. And I know Alex and I used to always sit together because Alex had some of the bad, some I mean really bad eyesight. And uh, he would always say, Roger, what quarter is it, or what's the score, uh, or how much time we got? Uh, but but Alex couldn't see that well. He he knew which, which city he was in, didn't he? Well, he knew he was on the training camp. I, I mean, he was on the field okay. at Tiger Stadium. <laughs> okay. He was okay. What is it? Well, in the early 60s, it it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, We had a lot of fun. Uh, We used to go to Larco's Italian restaurant and see who could eat the most spaghetti and ravioli. And uh, it was a a lot of fun. We had fun together, and uh, we were a team. It was a lot different, I think, than the guys today. They all have their own little thing let's go and do this let's go we had our own togetherness and i would i would love to one of these days write a book about the things we did and the fun we had um 
you can't you can't duplicate what we went through. No, I didn't, but Bobby Lane, here's the thing that's unique. Bobby Lane was traded to the Steelers, and the Lions got a number four draft choice in 1960, and they drafted me for that fourth round pick. And then a lot of, a lot of press says that Roger Brown came from the Steelers, but it was, it was uh, the Bobby Lane trade. And I say that if they brought me for a Bobby Lane, oh, I got to be really great. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the fans would expect you to be really great. If yes, you yes. And, and to this day, I still think they hold it against me, you know, yeah. when I get to hold up. Because <laughs> Bobby was quite a guy, and I had a chance to play against him. So yeah. there you go. So when you and Karis and a couple other guys show up at a restaurant, the owner doesn't automatically close the door and say, uh, we're not serving anymore. He lets you guys in. Oh, no, they, they would, they would say, Hey, break open the freezer, bring out the food, <laughs> you know, but then again, I think we did our share of drinking cold beer and having okay. food, but more than that, it was just tradition. We were there. You had to know we were there and everybody had fun. Did they treat you as celebrities when you walked into a place? Well, not really. I know I walk into my own restaurant here in Portsmouth, and I I can't get in because I'm signing a lot of autographs. So we have fun, and we had fun back then. Uh, it's it's just too bad that it's such a short lived, short lived time. Um, I mean, time flies. It certainly does. Were you prepared for life after football? Oh, well, you better believe it. Because here's the thing that is going to really shock you. I know in my first year in 1960, I made $8,000 a year. And the coach said, when he signed me, he said, we're going to give you a $300 signing bonus. And they took the 300 out of the 8,000 and gave me a contract for 7,700. But back then I would have paid them to play. That's how bad I wanted to play in the NFL. That 62 season, was that your best season you think ever? No, that was the most notable. I had a lot of great, seasons with the Lions. I remember uh, Bill Wade, who played for the Bears. I remember I used to play in front of Alex Karras' brother, Ted, mm -hmm. Ted Karras. And I remember Wade dropped back in his end zone, and, and, and Ted kept bugging me in my way. I ended up picking him up and threw him, and I knocked Wade down. So I had a lot of good years, but I think the most notable was in 1962 when we beat the Green Bay Packers. Yes. And I, I tackled Bart Starr, I believe, seven times in that game. One for a safety. One for a safety. But you know what bothers me to this day? Back there, back then, we didn't keep track. We didn't keep record. And now there's a guy with the Kansas City Chiefs that are claiming that he had seven sacks in one game and he holds the record because they kept records back then. And I wanted to say, and I even called the, the headquarters in New York. I said that game in 1962 was nationally televised. Everybody in God watched it. Look at it again, and you'll see how many times I tackle Bart. Give me my record that I de deserve. Well, yeah. Did they ever call you back, or they just ignored me? Yeah. <laughs> well, it got lost with the concussions that I have. See? Oh. <laughs> well, that was a Thanksgiving Day game, and I think Bart Starr was 
you know, giving thanks that he was able to, to, to walk into the locker room and out of the locker room after it was all over. Yeah, well, well, Bart Bart ended up a good friend as well as Jerry Kramer and Fuzzy. I have kids that live in Green Bay, and they own a, a golf course in Ledgeview. And we go up every 4th of July and play golf. And I, I, of all the warm feelings that I have is with the Green Bay Packers. I think they were a hell of a team. They had a good camaraderie, and they deserve all the accolades that they get today. What I don't get is how you and a Jerry Kramer aren't in the Hall of Fame. I mean, you guys have been to six, seven Pro Bowls, or two of the top players at the time, and they just seem to forget about you guys. Well, they, they do. I mean, but, uh, you know, one of these days when I pass on, I'm coming back. If they ever elect me after I pass on, I will be there. Okay. Do you think, because you played when you did before the days of ESPN and the NFL Network and all this stuff, that guys like you and Kramer and, and several others just sort of get lost in, in history? I don't, I don't know what the secret is. I don't know how it works. Um, but, but, you know, it, it, it makes me think that you need to do a voodoo dance, (laughs) you know, but, but I think of all the people, I think Jerry deserves to be in the NFL. I think I do as well. Um, but then again, and Alex, yeah. But you know what? It would be great one of these years if they decided to have Jerry, me, and Alex all at the same time. That would be great. Yeah, that that makes too much sense. (laughs) Yeah. Was there a lot of pressure on you to replace Rosie Greer when you joined the Rams? No, not really. Rosie was always there. He was out on the field. He was at training camp. And I kind of felt sorry for him because I know how it hurt to be injured and not being able to play. And I can remember one time in particular, we were on a trip that Rosie made, and it was Deacon, Lamar, and Marilyn and myself, and we were playing cards together. And it wasn't poker or anything like that. It was just bid whistle, one of those damn games. And Roe came in, and we called him Roe, by the way. And Roe came in and he said, damn, you took my place on the team. Now you've got my place on the playing cards. And I really kind of felt bad for him because it did hurt not not being able to play and uh, knowing that his heart was with the team. Did he ever try to teach you how to crochet? I would hit him. <laughs> I would have really slapped him down if he had, but no, Wait, I'd yeah, say he, he can keep that. He, he, yeah, but he has those crochet needles. Those things can be deadly. <laughs> yeah, but he, he can keep going with that. I didn't want to do crocheting. <laughs> He created the sack, the head slap. He did it all. I taught Deacon the head slap. You got to think about this. In 1960, I broke into the NFL. I had a coach by the name of Earl Banks who taught us the head slap. And he would say, if you want to get to the quarterback, get the head going right or left. The body's got to go. If you move the head, the body is going, because if not, the head comes off. And he taught me that, and I started the head clap, and head slap, and I taught, told, talked to Deacon. I said, Deacon, this book you wrote, how the hell can you say you started the head slap? I did. And Deacon said, well, you may have, but I perfected it. So, <laughs> 
<laughs> I was deacon. Always had a good good answer for everything. But the head slap was something I did from the day I entered the game. He he walked on water. Do you know that? And it wasn't frozen. <laughs> yeah. What was it like when George Allen was your coach? How did he differ from uh, George Wilson? Well, uh, George Wilson was was a coach from the old school. Uh, George Allen was awesome. He liked the older ball players, and he would burn you out. But he was a great guy to play with, and and when you played for Coach Allen, you were a part of his family. Because the kids, everybody was out there. George Allen Jr., Bruce Allen, they were all on the field. They were all there helping you. And to play for George Allen was awesome. The only difference is is that you had to be in pretty damn good shape when you came. If not, he'd burn you out because he liked the older ball players. Now, you were the first NFL player to weigh over 300 pounds. Did that work in your favor, or did that work against you? Well, the only thing that worked for me is that they find me. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, I, every every time you turn around, it was $100, it was $70, and I had to lose weight, and I spent so much time dieting that it took my strength away from the game the next day. I would say it was, I was a little ahead of my time because I was still the fastest, the biggest, and I could get the job done. But the coaches wanted me to be lightweight and, and, and they wanted me to lose weight. And that was, uh, that was a, that was a de- detriment. Um, but I was a little ahead of my time. I think today with these guys that are damn near 400 pounds, I wouldn't have been that heavy, yeah. but I was pretty good for a man my size and getting the job done. Um, I would say the guy that I played in front of and when I played, I never talked about anybody. I never made them mad because it made them run harder and, and, and do a hell of a job. But I thought Jim Brown was, was quite a back. Bobby Mitchell was awesome. So was Lenny Moore, Hugh McElhenney. I mean, I could go right on and on and on. Uh, as long as you stop them and if you got your hands on them, they're not going to go any further. I know if I could catch you, I got you. And uh, Jim was good, but there was a lot of great players back then. And when I look at Jim Taylor and Paul Horning, these guys were awesome as well. Yeah, you're talking all Hall of Famers, all the names you mentioned. Yeah, and and one of these days I'm going to be there with them. And Roman Gabriel's another guy who should be in your teammate with the Rams. He said what? <laughs> Roman was was a good one. He was a good one. Good quarterback. The acting bug didn't bite you like a bit Deacon Jones and uh Alex Karras, Merlin Olson. Merlin Olson, you didn't go Hollywood? Well, I did go Hollywood, and I did a couple of movies back then. But they left me on the cutting room floor, <laughs> and I would have been a—I I would have had the Academy Award, but I didn't make it. With the movie Paper Lion, Sheesh. they gave the whole script to Alex, who was suspended that year. But there you go. Maybe you should have been betting with Alex and uh, Paul Horning. Yeah, I would have lost. (laughs) (laughs) 
Did you have a favorite quarterback to sack? Did I have a favorite? No, not really. I I think that I played against some of the greatest quarterback in the in the league. I played against Bobby uh, White Tittle, and and when you look at Bart Starr and Johnny Unitas, I mean th- those guys were in a league all by themselves, and to have played against them, it, it, it's awesome. And uh, I think with Johnny Unitas, when I look at uh, Jim Parker, as a guy I had more trouble with. And Carter got liver pills. I mean, this guy, <laughs> holy moly. I made him, I, I elected him for the Pro Bowl because he beat me up so bad. But he was a good one. Yeah. Was Parker the toughest one you went up against? Jim Parker was, I say, number one. And then John Thomas out with the 49ers and Billy Ray Smith with, with the Browns. I mean, I had some, I had some pretty tough guys to play against, but uh, Jim Parker and, and, and Don Shuler, who was my coach in Detroit when I broke out as a rookie, went down to Baltimore, and after my 1962 Thanksgiving Day game against the Packers, they moved Jim from tackle to guard in front of me, and I made him all, all Hall of Famer. <laughs> Did he ever send you a thank? Did he send you a thank you note for that? Did he? Did Parker send you a thank you note? I mean, (laughs) May and everybody thanked me for that. (laughs) You mentioned that you didn't want to upset the offensive lineman by talking on the field. Did Deacon talk a lot on the field? Deacon really didn't. You know, I, I would say I didn't. Deacon didn't, and most uh, defensive linemen didn't upset you. I mean, to talk crap on, you know, like a lot of kids today, these younger kids, I, I, I never did it. And, and guys, like I remember Deacon, Alex, me, we never talked uh, to really talk about their mother and all this and how their the shoes they wear. Or, 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 you know, we didn't do that. We just went out to try and beat you to death. And the more you talked about their family and how bad they were and their mother, the tougher they are going to be. So we didn't do that. I read somewhere that you retired when you still could have went on playing because you didn't want to basically have any more injuries. But if you would have kept playing, you would have been a shoe in for the Hall of Fame. Do you ever think to yourself, I should have kept playing? Well... I think about that, but you've got to realize, and now that i got a chance, let, let me just say this. I never quit because of injury. I never left for any other reason. But I started restaurants in Chicago. I had three fried chicken restaurants, and the Rams were paying me $30,000 a year. Can you imagine that? My restaurants were doing triple that. And I told the coach, I said, Coach, I've got to go. I've got a job to do. My restaurants need me. This is my future. And it's a business decision. And I left the Rams, and everybody wondered, and they thought I was injured. They thought everything was going wrong. But I had restaurants in Chicago, and when I left to run those restaurants, I'm still in that business. And it was a, it was a, it was a good business decision. What were the name of the restaurants in Chicago? In Chicago, they were called A Fry Kingdom. I had uh, one on the west side, south side. I was all over the place. And it was <laughs> fried chicken. How'd you, how did you become a restaurateur? I just decided I liked to eat and <laughs> I liked to cook, and that's when I started. And we did it. I had one on Roosevelt Road. I had one over on uh, Pulaski and Madison, Roosevelt and Central Park. I was all over the place. Okay. And then you become a, uh, 
a McDonald's franchisee? Then I went to work. I left. I sold those because it was pretty good gangbanging in Chicago. And I sold the restaurants, and I went to work for McDonald's, and I became uh, a human resource manager, and I covered the whole West, even Ray Kroc's household. And then I eventually wanted my own, and I bought one here in, in Portsmouth, and I ended up with three McDonald's right here in, uh, in Virginia. Back then, McDonald's were popular, but not like they are today. Oh, well, I did okay. I uh, <laughs> sometimes think right now I have a restaurant called Roger Brown's Restaurant and Sports Bar, and I have a couple of restaurants called the Cove Tavern. Um, but I, I have no, no regrets for what I did yeah. and, and I'm happy with Roger Brown's restaurant and sports bar and, uh, it's 16,000 square feet and it's quite a, it's awesome. Can you watch a lion's game during the season there? Oh yeah. I have <laughs> 32 TVs in this place. I wasn't happy with the game that the Lions played against the Cowboys. But, you know, I, I usually wear my jersey and my hat uh, when they play. And, uh, you know, everybody laughs at me. But we have a pretty good following in the restaurant for Roger Browns. And everybody likes the, the, they like the Lions. They like the Cowboys and the Redskins and the uh, Eagles. And Philadelphia. So we do okay. Yeah. Now you're also, we talked about not making it into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, but you have been selected for the Black College Football Hall of Fame with, I believe, uh, induction February 28th, 2015. Yes, yes, that's going to be in Atlanta. And I made the, in 2009, the National College Football Hall of Fame in uh, in Indiana, South Bend, right, and and this this will be an honor to to make that as well. And who knows, maybe when I pass on, they will put me in the National Football League Hall of Fame. Yeah, because going into the Black College Football Hall of Fame this year, you have uh, Richard Dent, Elsie Greenwood, Ernie Ladd, Ken Riley, Donnie Shell. And, mm-hmm. uh, and Coach W.C. Gordon. So you're, you're in some pretty good company, just as those folks are in some pretty good company with you. Well, hey, you know, I'm proud to be there with them, and uh, it, it's going to be an honor to be there and, and to wear their shield. Now, I read when you were in college that uh, to help pay for your tuition, you were a disc jockey? Yes, um, who, were, who were some of your favorite recording artists? Oh, my goodness. Well, of course, you know, uh, what the hell is the guy? I can't think of his name right now. I mean, I, I guess I have those uh, concussion things, but uh, well, I... No, James huh? Brown. James Brown. Oh, James Brown and uh, all of the Motown group. Um, I had a radio show in Salisbury, Maryland. And I, I lived in Nyack, New York, so everybody called me Nyack, and that was my name. And I had a, a rock and roll show on uh, WJDY and WICO in Salisbury. And uh, I used to have a, I, oh, God, I, I had a ball. And uh, a lot of people would, would write in and call in, and uh, I would give them, you know, the, uh, record record request, but I also took a little course while I was at Maryland State, and it was industrial arts, and we built radio and electronics was another course, and we did a radio show, and back then, Radio Shack was a mail order. And we ended up buying all of the broadcast equipment from Radio Shack. And we used to 
broadcast our own show from campus. And then to the WICO, wait, wait a minute, what is it, what is it? They decided, no way, you can't do this. We're going to close you up. <laughs> 